That's our entire show is talking and blabbing and all of the blabbing. Hey everybody, this is Big Z. I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast for Episode 7, our 2020 first episode. How's it feel, Ian? Time's going by quick. It is. It feels like the uh, year's already flown by and it's midway through January. Yeah, I feel like uh, if we don't... uh, what are we like? What are, what's today? The eleventh, thirteenth. Yeah, yeah, it feels like if you don't have your plan together for twenty twenty, we're already behind the eight ball. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, good news. That's exactly what this episode's all about. Is uh, what we're going to be doing in twenty twenty with the podcast and with the side by side guys brand and uh, the content we're looking to create and all the interaction with the community we're going to be doing. So uh, hold on to your shorts. It's going to be an interesting, fun episode. So thank you for joining us. Um, and, uh, look forward to our next episode as well, which hopefully, uh, if everything goes right, we can solidify our special guest and we'll be doing a, an interview, maybe a remote interview. Um, and, uh, thinking I might keep that a little secret for now and, uh, and, uh, tease you a little bit, but hopefully you'll tune in and maybe, uh, I'm looking at trying to come up with a way to make these things live as well. So that might be a good way to do a live episode. It's bold and ambitious, much like wearing a Seahawks hat today. It is. So so I like my hats. Um, if you've followed my personal profile, you'll know that I have many of them, and that collection is continuing to grow. And uh, I'm wearing my Seahawks in memorandum of their 2019 season, uh, falling to the Green Bay Packers this Sunday uh, in, in Seahawks fashion at the last minute. So uh, sorry to see my Seahawks go this year, but... Cooging it. Yeah. Yeah. Ho- I, I mean, I'd rather lose to the Packers than I would the 49ers. So let's put it that way. I, I disagree. I, 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 if anybody's going to win, I want it to be from the NFC West. I mean, I hate them. Don't get me wrong. But if Seattle's not in contention, I maintain that the NFC West is like the best conference in the NFL. So right. this isn't a football show, though. No one, yeah. no one that drives side by side. Like, like, like football, I'm, I'm totally so. distracted right now. Like, you have a great <laughs> head of hair for having like a hat collection that's that big to yeah. cover up such a great head of hair. It just seems like, yeah. <laughs> well, my wife and I were talking, we're thinking about growing it out. So oh, really? you, you may see me this summer with fewer hats on. But, dreadlocks? Or uh, what are we doing? Well, we're going full. You owe uh, it to me to run dreadlocks. We're going full, you know, Rasta. We're yeah. Gonna, we're going to go all the way across the top and down the back and yeah, it'll be great. I can't wait. Maybe I can include some of them shreddy colors you're wearing today. So man. shout out to the, the shreddy life. Yeah, man. So let's get into it. Uh, so I first wanted to kind of just, um, we haven't really done this in focus about who the Side by Side guys are and the brand and what we stand for and what, why we're here and, and all that. So uh, just real quick, wanted to hit up you know the Side by Side guys brand in general, um, kind of put together uh, just a, a one-liner that kind of summarizes what we do. And uh, we're a group of UTV uh, specialists and personalities that want to explore, test, and experience the off-road community products um, events and the outdoors in general, right? So, uh, you know, we got the spark, we got the, um, the passion of UTV off-road, uh, off-roading and the products and the, the machines and the community around it, um, a number of years ago. And, uh, so last summer, uh, last fall, um, I personally started to dedicate a lot of time to it. And, uh, so the side side guys brand is going to be something that's representative of the community of the industry, the, the technology and the advancements, um, and mostly uh, just to drive the passion, right? right. It's, it's to be behind the passion and to push it forward. It's going to evolve with the industry, where the industry goes, but at its core, probably be centered around the type of riding that we are and kind of how we identify as riders, like For sure. mountain riders, trail riders, you know. Yep. And, you know, I'm a big uh, upright seating, trail riding, Polaris loving type of rider. Uh, not that I don't, you know, devalue the other brands, the machines, they all have their purposes. And I, I tend to be more of an off-road trails, uh, up the mountains type of guy. Um, you tend to be more of a dooner and, uh, out on the coast. Um, and you've recently switched from the YXZ to the, to the Can-Am, uh, X3. So like we all have our own individual, like personalities sure. with our units, with our brands, with our, um, styles of riding. And I, and I want to add more people like that, right? We got, um, your brother, Ben, who rides a, a YXZ as well. Um, I got uncle Ben who rides a turbo Polaris razor. We got, um, you know, other people that we know that we want to bring into the fold and present every brand and personality type that, that riding styles, uh, personality type in the side-by-side guys brand. Right. 
And uh, the Off-Road Podcast, you know, what we're doing right now, right? This is a, a place for us to um, broadcast an audio and video form of the experience of the off-road industry, the UTV industry that helps facilitate dialogue between topics, people, brands, uh, products, the news, the culture, and the awareness of per- UTV personalities and products and events. So uh, this podcast is definitely going to grow, and we're going to get into that a little bit on you know what that looks like. Uh, and for the community out there watching or listening to this, um, we definitely want to hear back from you. So if you got ideas, if you have events that are g- you're going to be putting on in your area that you want coverage on, things like that, let us know. We're looking for uh, any and all of that stuff. The people that are running these events, like these small uh, localized events, have a lot that they're doing for their community. Um, and there's no reason why that should be hidden from the rest of the, the UTV community. So uh, in 2020, we want to just keep developing the Side by Side Guys brand and, and what we're doing here, get more people involved. And uh, one of the things that um, I continually see covering the industry is that there's a lack of um, b- products being dedicated to niche issues. Like they'll do, you know, obviously there's a money grab for the big issues, right? People are developing skid plates or A-arms or, you know, uh, axles or tires or whatever. Those are all big cash cow type products, right? They're going to be... Any sort of serviceable part. Yeah. Anything that's consumable, right? Sure. Anything that's meant to break, wear out, fall apart, whatever, um, is going to need to be replaced and with something quote unquote better, bigger, badder, whatever, right? So um, there's an underserved market in those niche things that people find on a, on a weekend basis where they find annoyances or issues, things like that. Um, and there's things like when you're when you're broken down on the dunes, right? Like that's one of the funniest videos to watch is when somebody's got three guys hanging off the back of their unit trying to hold the front end of their car up in the air so that they can escape the dunes when they've hit a witch's eye or a, 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 a hole or something and taking their front end out, right? Um, you know, there's ways we can fix that. Like we can make that kind of recovery easier for people, or there's tools that maybe you should carry with you. That would be a good thing for a UTV owner to carry with them. Um, and there's a lot of ideas that I have up in here that I think would be a great product set to bring to market. Um, and being a community based brand, I want to make sure that if, if you have an idea for a brand, if somebody out there in the community says, Hey, I have this idea for something, but I just don't have any way to make it. Uh, bring it up to our attention. Let's see if we can't make something happen and, and see that problem get solved. We are people who know people. People that know people that do things, <laughs> right? So, um, and then, you know, I've always wanted to have apparel, um, anything that kind of promotes uh, the personality of who you are, the driver you are, the unit that you drive. Um, you know, we can always buy the Polaris shirt or the Can-Am shirt or, what you know, whatever. Um, but I want to kind of develop that that whole concept of promoting your style and your brand and your identity of as an off-road rider. Um, kind of catered towards a machine or catered towards mountain, sand, trails, mud. Yeah. All, all of the above, above actually. Yeah. yeah. You know, we have everybody's, we have so many options and then the more options you add, the more um, diverse that combination becomes. Right. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there to provide apparel that meets our lifestyle. Um, as well as maybe even off-road um, focused apparel that's actually developed to make the off-road experience better. So it's not just a t-shirt with a saying, it's not just a, a hat with a logo, right? It's a, you know, a purposely cut and sewn piece of apparel that makes your experience better. Yeah. Something, um, maybe like what, uh, Sims is doing for fly fishing or Patagonia, you know, like UV, uh, resistant jerseys or something. I'm kind of surprised that you haven't seen much of that. I can tell you, and anybody can tell you that going out, if you're not wearing some sunblock or something, it can catch up with you very quickly. Oh, super quick. <laughs> yeah. And for all the guys that have the roofs and everything else, you know, there's half of you that's hot and half of you that's cold right. or half of you that's sunburnt and half that's not, you know, there's a lot of different situations where, um, having the right garment or whatever would make your life a lot easier at the end of the day. Um, Even if it just means keeping your face clean, like coming as somebody with a full uh, luscious facial hair, um, you know, getting dirty is one of the worst things at the end of the day to deal with. Right. Um, So we're looking to develop maybe some of those products uh, that help aid in the off-road experience. Cause that's really where I want to focus is at the end of the day, what was your experience? How did you feel? What can make it better? And, and all of that. So here, here, 
So once we start developing that e-com platform setup, we also want to bring maybe some of those third-party products that already exist to um, into our storefront. So you can also find a reliable, trusted place for products that you know that if you if you show up at that e-com store, you know you can drill down to what your machine is and what you have and know for sure that what you've ordered is going to be the right product for you and make your experience better. Right. Yeah, if there's one thing I'd like to see kind of change in 2020, it seems like end users and uh, riders have a tendency to air stuff like this, ideas on forums and pages as opposed to providing feedback to actual companies. Right. It's just kind of a head scratcher. Yeah, I definitely, um, part of part of my intended goal with the brand is to not only bring products to the consumer that are relative to, to their their writing style and their experience, but also provide the feedback to the, the manufacturer, the vendor, um, to let them know, hey, great product, but you, you fell short in this area. We want to identify that and help you make a better product. Bring something better, to, re, re, revision 2.1 or whatever it is of that product to the market so that we make it the best we can possibly have. Because it's just going to benefit us. It's going to benefit them financially. It's going to benefit the entire community. Right. So, um, yeah, e-com, that's going to be something I focus on this year. And uh, hopefully the community will reach out and let us know what they want, what they like, what they don't like. Um, and um, No feedback is bad feedback. Right. It's negative feedback the way I see right. it. And um, the yeah. interesting thing is that for every negative feedback you get, you know there's like at least 20 other people that just didn't take the effort to say it. Right, right. So, um, and then to kind of complement that, because uh, the idea is that you're only bringing quality products to the market, you're not bringing the ones that are failing to do their job, uh, is to bring kind of some, some data behind that. And we'll get into a little bit more of how we're going to do that. But uh, we don't want to just say that it's good. We don't want anyone, anyone to ever think that, you know, someone, you know, full throttle battery sponsored us just to say that they have a great battery. Like there needs to be data behind it that says, hey. Zach, they do have a great battery. <laughs> wait, do they offer more than one? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll have to look into that. All right. Uh, but basically, um, just to to put data behind our decisions and why we're saying things that we're not looking like we're bought off or sponsored in a way that would make our opinion invalid. Um, and so, we're looking to create an entire ecosystem around that. So, and then if you look at uh, where we were in 2019 um, September, um, my focus was to start an off road garage, the side by side guys off road garage, where it's a um, UTV focused place where you could come get your unit fixed, upgraded, accessorized, etc. Um, and we had a shop all planned out and we were going to move forward with it, printed business cards and all that jazz. Uh, and then that, that opportunity of that location fell through. Just some real estate trouble, essentially. Yeah. You know, economics Challenges. and politics, right? Right. So, uh, because that fell through, we kind of changed focus on the intern because we have to get, I needed to get my ball rolling to facilitate, um, you know, not having a job and all that kind of stuff. And just so everybody else, like, oh, we're, we're not making money from the podcast. This is not something that someone's sponsoring and paying us a thousand bucks a month to do. So it's what actors call a passion project. Exactly. And we're all about passion. So, um, you know, the off-road garage is still something I have wanting to do. It's still a passion to be out wrenching on things and experiencing new things. Uh, through the through the product reviews we do and all that, it gets us out wrenching on stuff, but it doesn't get it ex get us experiencing new things that we wouldn't otherwise have touched, right? So I want to see um, that opportunity come to light, if possible, if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then I need to abandon that dream. But um, the Eastern Washington, where we're where we're based, right, really doesn't have anything but dealers. Um, right. You know, no one's out here doing upgrades and accessories that are non OEM compatible. So you can't go to your local dealer, get a portal kit. You can't go to your dealer and get a supercharger or, you know, a bigger turbo or, um, you know, a third party non OEM light bar. Dealers buy out of catalogs. Yeah, they, they've got their incentives to buy into their programs. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's how they make their business thrive. Right. Um, and then there's a, the other part of that where it's like um, they're all selling upgraded warranties. That's where they're making a bunch of money. And to facilitate that warranty, you can't change the tire size. You can't change the axles. You can't change OEM belts to a third-party belt or whatever the case may be. And uh, so anyways, there's really a, a, an opportunity here in the Eastern Washington, Pacific Northwest area um, that I think needs to be filled. Um, I kind of want to be that person, but uh, if it makes sense for somebody else to do it, then I'm fine with that too. 
anyways, that's the uh, Side by Side Guys brand as it sits now and what we're kind of looking at doing. Um, and to get a little bit more nitty gritty into what we're going to be producing in 2020, uh, kind of want to dive into the podcast first. So we have the Side by Side Guys Off-Road podcast. Um, and as it sits now, we've kind of just said, hey, here's a topic we want to talk about. You and I, Ian, will just kind of discuss, make some bullet points and follow that so we don't get off the rails too far. And uh, But we want to really focus in on actually creating content on this podcast that is meaningful and informative and interesting. And it's not just you and me talking all day For long. Sure. Uh, as our wives will attest, it gets pretty boring if it's just us talking about ourselves all day. So uh, the first thing we want to introduce is the Get to Know series, which uh, we want to introduce new um, podcast episodes that have interviews with personalities in the UTV industry, people that are either athletes, influencers, brand makers, um, broadcasters, publishers, whoever it is. Um, and so that's what we're hoping to do maybe next podcast episode. Yeah, hopefully get in front of some racers, some influencers, and then some people who do both at the same time, just get an interesting contrast. Yeah. And if there's any opportunity to maybe have a topic where that personality can speak to that topic, right? and then have a contrasting view maybe from somebody else that's in that in, in that part of the industry, and bring those two to, to a discussion... That's kind of where we want to be uh, making that content for. So Yeah, it's almost a discussion unto itself these days in terms of, uh, you know, you see racers, influencers, you start to see them slowly but surely kind of molding into one. And if they aren't, if they're not focusing on developing content, specific content towards sponsors, it's almost like that's starting to become a relic of the past. You know, some of those race teams that aren't doing that, aren't focusing on developing content, they should be. No right. question about it. I mean, even even within the last couple of weeks, you start to see some threads on uh, UTV forums really kind of promoting that that's the direction that we are all going and you need mm -hmm. to get on board with it. Yeah, for sure. And there's a lot around content, whether that be video, right? whether that be audio, um, media posts, or just simple news discussions, things like that. Yeah. Um, and there's something to be said for uh, people talking to the internet, but there's also something even more interesting to have an understanding of who that person is, who that personality is, that brand is, to put something behind that discussion that brings credibility, that brings interest, that brings experience, that you know that when they say something, you know the context around it, you know the history behind that person's thought process and why they may be thinking that and why they why you can trust them to know what they're talking about. So the Get to Know series is something I hope will take off and be great. Uh, it'll be included in the podcast just as another episode, uh, but it'll be titled Get to Know and then that person, personality, brand, whatever it is. Um, something else we want to bring to the podcast is the Behind the Brand series, uh, which is us reaching out to brands that we have um, dealt with in the past and or have had experiences with or uh, we know have experiences with and uh, bring more of a story to that brand. Who are they? What started it? How did they get to where they are now? What kind of efforts are they putting into those products or those ideas? And that could be a manufacturer or a uh, mom and pop shop. For sure. Yeah. And that's the thing is like a brand can be anything from a person, a, a retail shop, a manufacturer, um, a reseller. Um, I don't know if you've ever like heard of the Revzilla.com story oh, yeah. of who they are, how they started out um, in an industry that was changing, that no one understood what they were doing. Like that's a that's an awesome story uh, for the. Uh, they started in motorcycle, I believe, and now have reached into the off road world and the um, uh, dual sport world and overlanding world. So um, those are the kind of stories I want to tell through our podcast, right? Get those brands, those ideas uh, into a discussion format to where we can talk about where it all came from, where it's at now, and where it's going. Uh, another series we want to add uh, is the On Location series, where we are visiting um, those brands that we just talked about, right? Those behind, this, behind the brand uh, featurettes that we're um, going to these places that are influencing their local communities and areas of UTV um, passion in their community. So um, this could be a retail shop that is just performing, outperforming everybody, right? Or maybe someone that is known to just give amazing customer service and qu top quality products, willing to go the extra mile. Um, and 
bringing those people into the fold as well and highlighting those personalities and those efforts that they've done. Um, you know, a lot of times these, these shops or these brands or these businesses that support our community never get a lick of media, media coverage or a lick of um, gratitude or, or just community involvement outside of being at an event or something like that, having a booth. So um, I think they, have, they all have stories. They all have unique experiences. They all have reasons for being who they are and why they treat people the way they do and why they make the products they do. Um, and I think being on location to really get a sense of who they are, the, the family of employees that's there, you know, the type of environments that you can expect going to those businesses uh, would be a great story to tell as well. For sure. Lastly, uh, we wanted to include a, like a special teardown series where we cover either experiences, trail rides, um, events that maybe were very specific to a person or group, and really bring uh, the community into a journey along that story of how, how did it come around, what was the build up to that event, like how did it happen, what was the experience in that event, and we're talking about this could be, you know, a world record setting thing. This could be a, uh, just a, a really special trail ride. This could be a life and death event that happened. Um, it could be any of those like, right. one-off stories that doesn't really fit a, a promoting a brand or a, a product or anything like that. It's more about a personal or a group of people's experience that they would like to tell that story. Um, and that story a lot of times is that stuff that you sit around campfires or that stuff you sit in the garage and tell. And it usually only gets to one, 10, 15, 20 people. It never gets to a wide audience that would really benefit from that story. Um, and like when I talked about um, when that tree came through the firewall and, and nearly got my legs, right? Like to me, that was profound. And I'm there's a few people that out there that found it interesting. And that's really what I want to promote is that there was an impact on someone's life or 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 success or whatever it was. And there's going to be people out there that can benefit from that. And uh, we want to tell that story as well. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of stories within this community. You know, this community tends to kind of organize these rallies and these rides and stuff a lot more than I ever experienced in motocross. I rode, I rode motocross for roughly about 20, 25 years somewhere in that ballpark. And I can tell you maybe two or three times I actually went to uh, an event or a race. Primarily what it was is you go out with your riding buddies. Well, with UTV, it's it seems like virtually everybody that's involved in this hobby makes it a point to come out to one of these events. And it can be East Coast or West Coast, whether it be Brimstone, Tennessee, or Coos Bay, Oregon. We've got rallies all across America, and it's such a big part of what we're doing. And I don't know, I don't know if it's just – it's an opportunity for everybody to get together and, and go have fun. Or if it's a, a situation where, you know, bikes are a little bit more flexible than UTV are, you don't, you don't have to have the real estate to go out and go rip around between the woods. Whereas UTV is a little bit more focused on actual purposed, uh, riding areas, be mountain trails or the sand dunes or something. But, you know, there's more events for UTVs, I would argue, between the 1st of June to the end of August than there is for bikes year-round. It's really interesting. Yeah, and they also, the other side of that, talking about each person's individual riding style and, you know, machine choice and setup choice and all that, the events that are available going into 19 and 20 and 21 are all very compatible with that different riding style, that different life uh, UTV choice than there ever has been before. Like there used to be only the, the one trade show or the one dune show or the one mud show. Now there's like a whole bunch of East coast mudding and Southwest mudding. And then there's sand dunes in the Southwest sand dunes in the Northwest. There's sand dunes, uh, in the middle of Idaho, there's, um, you know, trail ride, uh, competitions and there's rock bouncing competitions. There's all sorts of different shows now that your writing style, your personality can come out yeah. at these shows and you can really get the best bang bang for your buck and, and, and the event that you're going to. You know, and we don't want to speak to one end user. We don't want to speak to the guy that uh, just to the guy that likes to go out to the sand dunes, do 70 miles an hour through a whoop section. Because like if you go to UTV Takeover and you look at the age gap, you got guys out there on the sand between the ages of 16 to 50, 55, somewhere in there. And 50 that's, plus, yeah. And that's predominantly what you see. More on the side of, you know, under 40. You go to Rally in the Pines in Sam in Idaho, and it's pretty much the opposite. Like the majority of the people are over 50, you know? Yeah. So we want to speak to both. Yeah, there's definitely, um, 
an opportunity for everyone to have an event that caters to who they are and how they they enjoy the experience. And it's really, um, I feel like it's underserved in our market as far as explaining that. Like everybody wants as many people to show up as possible, right? Everybody's marketing their events to as big of a group as an audience as possible. Um, And... That's uh, why we're here. Exactly. We we are Pied Piper leading people towards the light. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're 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 the navigators and I think That's we right. can tell the story uh better than most and uh hopefully we can get out to as many shows as we can this year and and prove that. That's right. And and bring you for along for the ride because there's a lot to see, do and experience at these shows that you don't necessarily get pushed to because everyone's wanting to push you to the vendor or the product or right. whatever. Right. That's kind of kind of where we were at with the podcast uh, going forward for 2020. We have a lot of goals, but you know, I think we can accomplish a lot of them at the same time. And uh, as the industry gets to know who we are and what we can do and how the production quality works and, and all that stuff, I think we're going to have a pretty bright uh, uh, year ahead of us. Yeah. You know, in terms of what we have lined up over the next 12 to 18 months, I'm not overwhelmed yet. Yeah. But, you know, as this stuff starts to develop and starts to become uh, a lot closer to happening, it uh, it could get to that point. Like when you look at our calendar over the next 18 months, it is nuts. There's some very, very ambitious stuff that we're going to try and do, you know, specific to this community. I'm really looking forward to it, but it's going to be a huge undertaking. Right. Um, something I wanted to talk about that's not really on my bullet point list uh, for this episode, but I wanted to bring it out into who we are and, and how we do things um, and a way for us to um, be honest and transparent in how we do stuff around here um, is how we how we deal with sponsorships, right? This is something that um, we haven't really dealt with a whole lot because we've been self-funded most of the time with everything that we do. Um, and I kind of wanted to bring that topic up so I can be, for one, transparent with how I'm thinking, how we're approaching this stuff, um, and how we how we work our reviews and our opinions around that, right? So when we talk about sponsorships, um, you know, in the in the off road world, it's usually like, hey, can you send us product and money uh, to support our race team or our endeavor or whatever it is? Um, and up to this point, we haven't ever done a request for. Um, a product or a, a, a monetary value in that way. Everything's come organically. Yeah. And so it, it's who we know and, and if they're willing to help out or, you know, if we needed something, we bought it and, and are doing something around that. Um, and recently we started getting some brands that have requested, hey, do you, would you like us to send you the products for you to review um, and put on your, on your brand's media platform, right? And so... Going forward, um, whenever we produce a piece of content that's sponsored by somebody, it's going to be clearly labeled and displayed on that media content, whatever that is. So if it's a video, you'll know up front that this video is, was sponsored right. by a brand. If it's a piece of written content, it's going to have a disclaimer on that page, this product was sponsored by or whatever. Um, and whenever someone does approach us, the in my response to that approach or if we're in discussion of something, Uh, There's always a dedicated point of context that says we are an independent source of of opinion. We're not going to be swayed by if it was free, if there was, you know, extras given to us, if there was monetary behind it. And I will never do an agreement for um, whether that be a brand or a product or whatever that is um, in any context viewed as. Um, influential into the process of whatever we're doing. So um, I'll never do, just as an example, right? I'm not, I'm not going to say this is something we're doing, but as an example, uh, Joe Schmo's off-road shop is never going to send me a, an A-arm kit and $1,000, and then I'm going to give them a positive review when they have crap product. It's just never going to end up that way. Um, there may be times where uh, someone's requested us to review a product, and we just canned it because... It just was a bad fit. It was a bad product. It was just not good for anybody. Um, we'll take that opinion into our context when we're reviewing other things and when we're recommending products for people. But we're not in the business of shaming people and making products and people's efforts, you know, or being it, disingenuous or anything of that nature. Right. So if there's a if there's a situation where, you know, there was a big sponsorship for this review or this this video or this whatever, we're not going to you know, make it happen just because they threw money our way or anything else. It's only going to be ever produced because it stood, it stood on its own and they were willing to compensate us for our time 
in that method to to convey that message. Right. You know, as it pertains to who we we would potentially work with, I mean, you're going to see there's going to be some instances where we're really passionate about what it is that this particular manufacturer develops. I mean, no question about it. It could, it could be lighting. It could be tires. It could be wheels. You know, if it's something that we see has a heck of a lot of value towards our ride, I hope to convey that. You know, no question about it. Yeah, when, when our experience is benefited by a product, service, sure. group, team, whatever, we want to convey that to everybody else. Right. And so we're never going to just get a whole bunch of product from some random Chinese company to then do a review on it and say, hey, go to eBay and buy this for you know dirt cheap undercutting everybody else. Because we all know that there's Chineseium stuff that will always compete with USA made or, or high quality products. Um, but when it comes down to it, they're devaluing the con- consumer because they're they're hurting the industry versus benefiting the industry. And those are the people we want to work with, the people that are benefiting the industry so that our experiences can be bettered. So anyways, I just wanted to be clear about how we do things going forward is uh, there may be times where we reach out to a brand and say, hey, we, we see your product that you're putting out or your service or your whatever, and we think it's a really great thing. Uh, we would like to experience that so that we can then convey that to our audience. Right. Um, there may be times where a brand or a product or um, whatever reaches out to us and says, hey, come over and check us out. Let us uh, do a feature do a feature with us. Um, and they may provide like compensation for room and board or travel or whatever. Uh, and all that stuff will be transparent. Right. I think uh, one thing that we're incredibly fortunate in, in regards to um, UTV kind of sort, uh, sorts itself out. You know, if you you make garbage product, you're going to get exposed. So I think a lot of that stuff has weeded itself out already. Yep. And, and to, to speak to that, we also have a ton of mom and pop shops in our industry. Like there's always that one guy that has that great idea for a product and never gets the exposure to really take off. Right. Um, and you know, sometimes honestly, they don't want the exposure because it's just a hobby for them and they don't really want to make it a full-time business. Uh, But for the guys that do want to make it a full-time business and they have a great product, like, why not feature that? Like, give them the same exposure that the multi-billion dollar companies do, the same exposure that the multi-million dollar companies do. There's no reason why in the internet age that a small company or a small uh, brand can't get the same exposure as everyone else. Right. A little longer than a few minutes later... Took a little break there, and uh, Zach and I had an absolutely fantastic discussion and then realized quickly that we weren't recording. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so, I mean, you were just talking to, as somebody that works with a brand that has product that people and, like, racers and tend tend to want as a sponsorship item, um, you had some perspective on, you know, the recent state of sponsorship, right? We were just talking about how we're going to be transparent with how we're sponsored with what we do. Right. Uh, how, how was, how was your perspective on sponsorships from an OE, OE standpoint? So it's evolved tremendously since roughly about 2016 In 2016, when the line came out, we were, uh, we were looking for people and we would pre-qualify those people via, uh, companies that we were already doing business with organically. So if I had questions about, a race team, and it, it started predominantly with racing. Um, I would reach out to a couple of people that I know that were working with them, and essentially, you're doing your due diligence, almost like a job interview. Right. And it's not that easy anymore. It's changed drastically. We had a lot of referrals. We had a lot of people that was brought to the table by other companies and people that we discovered, and we we worked with them and got little to nothing. And I, I'm going to more lean towards the nothing in return. Right. And when I mean nothing, I mean literally nothing, not even an Instagram post, not even a tag. So essentially, when you're talking about retail costs, we're handing you $500 to $800 worth of free product and a handshake. And that's it. End of the relationship at that point. Right. And, and, and no one wants to come down to contracts and to like, like the nitty right. nasty stuff, right? right. And, I, no, and no company is going to... If you... If they provide you with a product that costs something of, I don't know, let's say like 500 to to $1,000, no company is going to expect you to just drop what you're doing and go out there and make specific dedicated content towards what they manufacture. Nobody's expecting that. But I mean, an Instagram post, it's not too much to ask, you know, this, that, and the other. So my point being is, is we, we've gotten a lot more stringent. 
you know, and we've had people get referred to us that we uh, just chose to work with that, that didn't amount to anything. We've had people referred that we don't work with certain people and we chose to anyway. And they've been some of the best brand ambassadors that we've had. And right. I especially noticed that like in the overland sector, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's just such a weird mix. And I, I'm sure if you're trying to get a sponsorship with full throttle battery right now, it's a little harder than it was this time two years ago. It's actually a lot harder. And a lot of that is because we've learned a lot of lessons. Right. You know, there was an interesting thread on uh, Facebook that was related to this and and what determines whether or not you get a uh, sticker on a race car, you know, and, and it kind of led to basically uh, manufacturers and racers having some internal dialogue in the thread. And it was pretty interesting. But I mean, I think these people need to understand that, and especially like the race teams and stuff that a lot of these companies are going to be a little bit more stringent about how they uh, sponsor because they've learned some lessons over the years. And I think that it's an interesting idea, like you were bringing up the stickers, right? Back in the old days of racing, for example, I mean, it's the easiest way to translate this kind of idea, right? It's through racing. Um, is that, I mean, even with NASCAR right now, right? You, you, you pay to have your logo on the car so that when it's viewed, whether that be through imagery, posters, video coverage, TV coverage, whatever, that the more you pay, the more likely you're going to be seen because you're able to be seen from a distance or, you know, in the photo, the front of the car versus the back of the car, things like that. And you would pay a premium for it. It's the farther for, forward you got, you know, the more close to the racer's door seal you got. All those things like kind of indicated how much you were going to be paying for that sponsorship. Right. And a lot of that was financial sponsorship. It wasn't necessarily like it is nowadays where people are like, hey, I need axles. Like who can sponsor me for axles? Sure, sure. Um, and the idea that in the culture that we're in now with social media and everything else, uh, back in the old days, you were paying for that premium because there was TV coverage. There was there was either ESPN or NBC, NBC Sports or somebody going to come along and put it on a channel somewhere on the cable universe where people were going to see it. And you had the potential to be seen by millions of people, right? Right. right. But now with social, right? All it takes is, an, is one thing to go viral or one thing to be top of the top of the food chain or something that be uh, top quality to be shared exponentially more times than that. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be a high profile race team. A simple <clears throat> promotion all. could get in front of 200,000 people just like that. Yep. So. And uh, what's really interesting is the way, like there was a post by the OG uh, Joey D Joey. from, from <laughs> UTV Underground who is now heading up four wheel parts. Sure. Uh, he's doing a lot of interesting growth with four wheel parts to push the brand in the racing scene because he knows that the racing scene, basically every single person in there has a truck, has an off-road vehicle of some sort or, tr or a truck that operates in a capacity like an off-road truck and knows that four-wheel parts is strategically aligned with that segment, right? So he's pushing hard into the, the racer category and all that. And he had a great thread about yeah. what to expect for sponsorship, right? I guarantee you that guy knows how important influencers are though. Oh, for sure. You know, there might be some people that he works with that have never set foot on the, you know, on a racetrack, but they're just as important. Yeah. You know, it's very similar to what happened in motocross when uh, the freestyle movement, the free ride movement took off, mm -hmm. you know, things, sponsorship dollars started to go towards uh, freestyle guys, towards uh, free ride video production companies and stuff that, uh, as opposed to race teams, I, I, there's no shortage of money, so I don't know right. how, who is affected, but uh, you do start to see UTV start, start start to gravitate towards that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, um, in the context of that example, if you look at Joey D's uh, roster of athletes he's been signing, right? Uh, not every single one of those has been the top podium winners for the last five years, the 10 years, like you had to be back in the old days. It's the people that have influence and people sure. that have uh, the strive and the and the the grit to push through losing and the people that have a story to tell and the people that have the willingness to share it on social media and the people that have a willingness to produce media around that struggle and that win and that loss and that um, that setback or yeah. whatever it was like that's who they want to sponsor yeah. because that's who's going to get the interaction. You know, there's an interesting desert class that uh, we had a guy approach us that he asked for. It was pretty minimal amount and it wound up being something to the tune of about four to five batteries. You know, with a bit essentially a retail value, you're probably talking like twelve hundred bucks. And we didn't really understand who he was. He'd won a he'd won a championship. Um, his Instagram 
basically his Instagram follow was something to the tune of about 600, 700 followers. So you could tell that that wasn't really a priority of his. Right. We went ahead with the sponsorship because he was a successful racer. You know, we wanted to see, it was kind of an experiment mm -hmm. and uh, never saw anything, nothing, absolutely. And and that's not the only, that's that's not an isolated incident. So we're, we're a little bit more careful about how we move forward. And I know I've said this before, but I'm going to look at the camera. But if you take, as it pertains to UTV, if you look at how Full Throttle's marketing budget is allocated, so you've got this pie right here and it's split into thirds. And 33% roughly right now goes to uh, working with racers. Another 33% goes to working with uh, influencers. And then the final 33% goes to working with other manufacturers. So if you uh, come to these shows, you'll see some of these manufacturers that are on vendor row. There's a very good chance that we probably already work with them. You know, I, I mean, as it pertains to my competitors in the battery industry, they're kind of asleep at the wheel. We're, we're really the only battery manufacturer that's really focused on off-road, uh, specifically in UTV. But if you go down these vendor rows, you'll see places like SSV, you'll see places like Rugged Radio, Baja Designs. They're running full throttle products and we scratch each other's back, you know, and I wouldn't have it any other way. You just been, been able to develop just unbelievable relationships and just, you know, capitalize on opportunities to do cross promotion and stuff. So it's, it's really exciting. And if anything, and I hate to be the one to break this, that, that pie, if anything's coming out of that pie, it could very well be racers because, you know, if you, if you have a chance to work with an influencer Maybe that influencer races. Maybe they're out there doing some epic stuff. And I mean epic. Um, are you going to pass up the opportunity to be visible by a quarter million people? Probably right. not. Right. Yeah, that's the thing is uh, to hit on what you one of the things you just said. Uh, there is always a, a circular pie with every financial budget for every company that has something to sponsor, right? And uh, whenever you take away from one side, it's always in a Go to sure. the other side. Sure. And if there's one thing that we benefit from, though, that pie right now is about this big, and it's just doing this. Right. So when you look in car audio, car audio, it's this big, mm -hmm. and it's not getting any bigger. Right. So if you want to grow, if you want to grow into uh, car audio, if you want to, if you want to move more, uh, I'm not talking just marketing. I'm talking about sales. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to displace. Right. You have to displace other manufacturers you know, competing brands. Um, so it, it's interesting. If there's one thing that we really benefit from, I'm not trying to scare anybody when we're talking about this because that pie is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And everybody. we're talking more like industry-wide. It's not just yeah. full throttle. Like everybody, yeah. this is the way they, they work, right? And the other thing I wanted to hit on was what you said about scratching each other's back on the industry, right? Like there's, when you scratch each other's back, it's not just I'm trying to get a financial edge on something or somebody or a product or a brand or whatever. It's, these guys are all going to shows together. These sure. guys are always working to the same audience. These guys are always working and they're next happy to, each to promote. Other. And there's no reason for them when they're complementary products to not recommend each other if they have a good product. Right. And if you have a good product, you want the good product on your car. You want the good product in your booth, right? Right. And it's not about buying somebody's opinion off or buying off somebody's recommendation. It's about you've built a relationship where you can trust that. If you do well for somebody, they're going to do well for you back. Sure, and that that goes into the sponsorship. Right. Like, if and and going back to that discussion that um, Joey D had posted, a whole half of that he had a whole bunch of bullet points, and half of them were all related to creating content and being a a spokesman for what you're essentially getting for free, um, and providing that value back to the brand. And when you are um, in a place of trust like that, like you were saying handing off some product and a handshake, um, you basically burn bridges completely off when you don't respect that. And if you're willing to take something from somebody and not return the same or more value back, you're not going to get very far in your sponsorship. Right. Um, I, well, I know you've had experiences like that where it's like you, someone's told you, don't go with that person. So we have provided product for guys that have a following to the tune of a hundred to 200,000 followers got literally nothing. Like nobody would ever know that there was a full throttle battery in that car. <clears throat> and yet, well, I mean, I'll give you an example. The first guy that we ever sponsored is a short course racer that uh, at the time he was on the Oregon coast. Now he's in Southwest Washington. He's, you know, from a dedicated content standpoint, has he ever done a dedicated full throttle post? Uh, I'd, I'd have to go through his media and check it. I'm not 100% sure. We get tagged in everything he does. We get thanked every time he wins. We get shouted out every time he wins, and he wins a lot. And uh, 
combine that with the fact that, uh, I mean, we've probably got, I don't know, probably less than 300 bucks invested into them. So it's, it's a no brainer. <laughs> well, and it's if an he's absolute listening no-brainer. now, he's in a lot, lot more. <laughs> well, and, but combine that with the fact, and th- this is where that value starts to really separate that it separate itself is like on Facebook on the thread. I mean, take a stab at how many times somebody on the Can Am page, the Terex page, the uh, RZR page, the uh, writing page. I mean, you've got RZR Life. That's basically a writing page. It's not just strictly RZRs. You've got uh, uh, Northwest UTV. You've got uh, Side by Side Addicts, these huge, huge presence. And anytime somebody pops up for a battery recommendation, which happens daily, right? that guy is commenting that this is what I'm running. It's been flawless, you know, and you just multiply that by like five to 10 times because that's how many people that we're working with that are doing things like that, that are advocating for the brand. And it didn't cost us a heck of a lot. And they've become brand ambassadors. Right. This is where that conversation you have to have before you make a decision as to whether or not you're going to partner with a race team, you know, what you're going to get back. And I mean, there's situations where we get back enough. There's situations where they've been just fantastic. And anytime they call me and they need something, I'm going to figure out a way to tell them yes. Right. And that goes back to uh, the educational side of things. Like what we're trying to roll into with what we're doing with side by side guys, like if you're educated on the product and you know it's a good product and you know how to use the product, how to install the product and all that, you're going to do it and you're not going to have any problems and you're going to have a great experience going forward. And then once you've had that experience, you're going to portray that to everybody else. Like there's no reason for you to recommend anything other than that experience that you've had because you validated it. And so if you are an OE and you're sponsoring somebody and you've educated them on that this is why the product's great, this is why you should pick this for your for your fit, for your team, if like the OE's reaching out to the, to the athlete or to the whoever, um, if they understand that, they're going to understand the value you're sure. providing them and they're going to want to talk about sure. it. Sure. So and there's not a lot of difference between content creators, what we're doing right now, right, and uh, race teams versus uh, other manufacturers. There's, yep. there's and a fine line. Speaking to that conversation, that was like the huge one of the huge selling points of that conversation was everybody's a content creator nowadays, and you're either choosing to not make content, choosing to make irrelevant content, or make content that benefits you. Don't make me make the lemonade stand analogy again. <laughs> So anyways, it was a fun little discussion we had off camera and then we right. brought it back on camera right. because we wanted to make sure it fit, uh, on, got on the episode because it's, it's a great topic to speak about. Um, yeah. And this is a perfect example of when you look at an outline and you think, yeah, Zach and I are going to nail that in about 59 minutes. This is why the show <laughs> winds up going two hours. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much fun thing to talk it about. Is. That. Yeah. Yeah. I always worry about, uh, when are we going to run out of things to talk about? I just don't see it happening. Yeah. I, 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 when you asked me that first day when we were talking about starting the podcast, I was like, no, there's always something to talk about. Always something to talk about. <laughs> yeah, and the beauty is about off-road is there's nothing to talk about. We'll go out and go ride and we'll find something. Uh-huh. We'll, we'll, we'll invent things to talk right. about. <laughs> well, how many times have you been in the garage and you've not had something to talk about? Oh, Even yeah. if you've talked about it before, you're willing to talk about it again. For so. sure. Um, anyways, uh, if you're looking to get sponsored out there, um, boy, we just went we'll, way off the rails. On I'll, that one. I'll make a <laughs> quick link for you guys to um, Joey's post on, I think it was Side by Side Racing uh, Facebook group. Um, I'll make a side by side, uh, link to that and I'll put it down here somewhere. So look for that and I'll put it in the description. Um, yeah, and, the, and those posts and stuff, cause he's put out a few of them lately. Uh, they're not meant to like confront people. They're just meant to get people thinking, you know, when you look at the threads and you start to see the dialogue that's transpiring, you see some people are kind of embracing it and some guys are kind of getting a little bit defensive and that's right. not the purpose. It's more or less to just kind of think, get, get, get you thinking. Yeah. And, and if you f- start following those threads, you'll, those groups of people that you just mentioned are going to be easily identifiable as people that are new to the racing or people that have been in the old school racing or have been trying to figure out how to transition correctly. Right. So um, we'll link to that. It's a great uh, thread to follow. And um, if you haven't followed Joey D and what he's doing, I mean, that whole conversation came out of honesty. It was, you know, he's in a place of of sponsorship and he's just saying, hey, we love the community. We love the people that are here. We just want to be honest with how we're approaching this because if you approach it the wrong way, you're never going to get anywhere. So look forward, uh, look for look for that link down below. And uh, while you're there, hit that subscribe button and uh, hit that uh, notification bell. Well, and not to derail us any further, but you put something out to this week. You put something out in relation to uh, should we generate our own page? Oh, yeah. Yeah, our own Facebook group. Yeah. This is why my answer is yes, because it gives people 
who would follow that page more access to ask, ask these questions. So we can pose some of these questions, pose some of these conversation topics and just let people organically chime in. Because if it's on Facebook, they will. Yeah. How many emails have we gotten in regards to uh, questions that people are asking us to cover on this show? Mm -hmm. I've gotten a few, no question about it, but I'll bet you it'd be a hundred times more if there was a forum for people to jump in and, and people yeah. feel more connected to it. I mean, it's just much, much easier for them to just post a comment or post a question, post feedback, as opposed to composing an email, right. not knowing if it was seen. <laughs> right. So that's why my answer is yes. I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, I see it as a win-win. I see it as a win-win for the show. I see it as a win-win for what we're generating, the whole ball of wax. Yeah, and I think there's something to be said about um, the different, the different, locations of of groups on the web on the on facebook and the web it like it's almost like the wild wild west in some facebook groups like anything goes whoever's the loudest with the biggest voice is going to be the one that's heard or influencing the rest of the discussion um and the moderators are only there to do their job of take out the bad stuff that's right. not a, applicable to the group or to take off the guys that are just haters or whatever but as far as content and opinion it's like a wild wild west yeah and it's tough to regulate that stuff i mean you got to let it play to it to a large degree if somebody s starts to take it to a personal level obviously you got to regulate that but you know <clears throat> i i manage a page there's no uh there's no policy as it pertains to politics because i know that's like a hot button right now so I mean, right. if, if somebody posts something about a particular political view and then somebody has an opposite political view i'll let it play out so long as there's not fighting but right. you know if one side posts something and another side posts something and basically just generate this argument you got to shut it down but and i think that if you start a group uh with the core value of being there for value sure and not to be just a vocal uh soapbox yeah you gotta you know it didn't take me long to realize that humans are not mature enough for social media. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in today's political landscape, I've never felt more validated in that opinion. But so you just got to be careful because things can get so divisive that it's right. just nonproductive and you don't want people button heads. For sure. And so, um, you know, we've gotten a lot of positive motion towards starting that group. So I think that might be something we start uh, sure. after this episode. And I, I think and it's start a no promoting. brainer. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a little bit about what we're bringing to the podcast in 2020, uh, some new series that we're going to go through and start creating content around. Um, and I wanted to also hit, uh, you know, what we're doing with the side by side guys brand and in, in regards to the media that we're going to create. So, uh, we have a lot of projects and irons in the fire, uh, as me personally and, and things that we're working together on and, and other people that we're working in, to bring together, uh, to make content for, um, uh, but in just general theory, like this is how we're approaching content creation going into this year. Um, and the first one is the easy one, the product reviews, right? Yeah. Everyone's looking for some sort of honesty around a product or a series of products or a brand or whatever the case may be. Um, and so we've done a couple product reviews uh, last year and I am working on editing together a video for uh, a product from Invictus Off-Road. So if you haven't heard of them, go check them out, InvictusOffRoad.com. Uh, that review is not going to be like most reviews. It's going to be uh, honest. It's going to be um, upfront and uh, there's a lot of good features and there's some things that I didn't like and, and all that. And it's all going to be laid out on the table for everyone to take it uh, how they see fit. So... Um, we're looking to do a lot of product introductions and explanations of why yeah. they exist and what they're for and who they're for. Um, yeah, I can tell you some of the feedback that I've gotten on product reviews, you know, it's not negative, but it's more or less a curiosity as mm -hmm. to when it's going to come out. Cause we've worked with some people, uh, we've received some products that we haven't released a, a review on yet. And I can tell you right now, Zach, Zach's a producer. I'm a producer. Zach's a photographer. I'm a photographer. <laughs> Zach uses Adobe Premiere. I use Adobe Premiere. There is no way we're not gonna we're gonna put something out that isn't absolutely top notch. Right. Like like you don't know what goes into this. Like we go into coloration, <laughs> you know, it, it, the whole ball of wax audio. We take a lot of this stuff seriously. We want to put out stuff that is very, very valuable from an information standpoint, but we also want to put out stuff that's very good, to, very good, and very easy to look at. Right. If that's you, our that's that's our thing. You yeah, know? I, mean, I mean, 
for if you boil it down, we're making what we would want to see. Absolutely. And we were we we identified a long time ago that this type of value, this type of production is not available in our industry at the moment outside of the top dollar, top tier OE type stuff. Sure. And there's no reason we have to spend 150 grand on producing a commercial yeah. for something. Yeah. When you look at an awesome clip on Instagram, and the most recent that I saw um, was a, uh, I think it was, uh, my gosh. I think it was a it was a Polaris chase and a Yamaha through a couple of doubles, and they were just like this Hall of Fame drone pilot is following. <laughs> uh, uh, oh my gosh, who was Pro- it? Props to all the drone pilots out there getting into the uh, racing uh, video drones. That is not an easy skill to pick up. Right, right. I want to say one of them was R.J. Anderson. I think he was driving the Turbo S and he was chasing around a YXZ, and this this Hall of Fame drone pilot is chasing these guys down, and it, it was a viral clip, and you know. That's not some clip that got put together by a, by a writer. That was a production right. company that came yeah. in that spe- specifically specializes in drones. Right. You know, they had control over all the data. They had control over all the media. They're the ones that colored it, did the audio, the whole ball, and edited it. And uh, there is a such a huge difference between professionals and amateurs. Yeah. You know? And I think that uh, that kind of speaks to what we were talking about earlier about people needing to become content companies for themselves is that everybody should start learning how to record video correctly. Like what's a good shot look like? What is, you know, a good setting for color look like? All that stuff because eventually every single buddy, every single person that's going to be involved in this industry and and other industries like just marketing in general is going to need to have those skills yeah. going forward. And I I, I be I, Go ahead. I was gonna say I'd be willing to bet that in like high schools and colleges, it's gonna be something that's more of a, a pre not um, not a prerequisite, but something that's built into like the business learning sure. experience. Sure, and uh, like uh, my recommendation is to embrace it because you don't get too many outlets where you get to be creative, and there's no wrong way to do this. It's just trial and error, you know. And uh, I. I don't know if it's because I come from a background. I was in a, you were a musician. I was a musician. And uh, if you uh, haven't figured it out yet, we're all really similar. To, yeah. I'm just, <laughs> it's like a 15 year age gap, but whatever. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, it gives you an outlet to be creative. And there wasn't anything that I enjoyed more about being a musician than recording and seeing things come together mm-hmm. and, and hearing it come together. It's the same with video production. You get yeah. to see this stuff. You get to see that shot that you just nailed and yeah. you just know that it's going to look so good. And it gets, it gets addicting for sure. Yeah. And, and that's why it's, you know, it just builds and snowballs on our passion for off-road because we know that there's an experience behind every vehicle every trail, every event, like there's an experience and, a, and there's a passion for it in us that we want to portray to everybody else because it, it feeds our experience desire and it also feeds our production, you know, desire to, to create content. So, um, that's really where we're both kind of just based out. Yeah, of and, and, a, and we're not developing it. You, you touched on earlier. We're not developing it so that it's going to get seen by a quarter million people. We're developing it. So it looks cool for us. <laughs> right. Serious. And, Serious. Every, like, and everybody else uh, wants to see stuff like that too. So. Same, same reason I used to record songs. I wanted to yeah. hear something back that was just awesome. <laughs> and, and be able to say that it was you, right? For, exactly. And so anyways, it's, uh, when we talk about producing, reviews and things like that. It's going to change a little bit over time as we get more experienced and more equipment and things like that. Uh, we're pretty good at being lean and mean and making things work. Um, but we're we're trying to portray the quality of a product while at the same time the applicability of the product to the person or the ride and the, uh, tar- the targeted audience for that product. A lot of times products get marketed to, for everybody. Yeah. And when in reality, it's really kind of meant for this like small segment of the market yeah. that should be buying it. But if anyone wants to buy it, well, we're going to take the money. For right? sure. So um, we definitely want to portray, you know, the quality, who it's intended for, um, if it's good or not, if it's a good value. Um, and then we want to bring in the long-term reviews, right? Yeah. Like we've been using this for a summer. We've been using this for over a year. Like it just depends on the interaction with that product and the timing of maybe upgrades or things like that. Um, but we want to be honest with how did this fare over 30 days? How did yeah. this fare over the summer? How did this fare in winter versus summer? Things like that. Um, and you know, we're looking to create a standardization around that. Like if we say a light's great, how do we know that we we've measured the light output of that light. We've measured how far it throws. We measured how wide it throws. We measured how many amperage, uh, amps it it draws. We had this Um, conversation three, four days ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we were talking about a, a, a light comparison in essence. It was like, let's, let's put it on over stock. Let's compare it to stock and then let's go, let's leave 
Coolin, Idaho, and go put on about 200 miles after 9 o'clock p.m., and then have another comparison at 2 a.m. Right. We'll do a temperature test on that light, and then we'll test, you know, what it's putting out versus, you know, light brand company X versus light brand company Y. You know, it's just kind of, this goes back to it's we're trying to create the stuff that we want to see. Right. When, when you're looking, and just to build off the light example, right? When you're looking for lights, it's easy for you to go on eBay and see that there's a $50 light bar from China. And there's also the $150 light from, I don't know, rough country. And then there's the $300 light, bar, light three from three to $500 hundred 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 from, well, no, they're even more like you got a three to 500 from rigid. And then yeah. you have a, then you have like a thousand one from vision, vision X or BC or, or anybody. So, um, you know, what, what difference do those make? Like, let's tear it down. Let's see yeah. what's inside of it. Or yeah. How is the ceiling, the weather ceiling on this? Like, is it going to be a good seal? Um, you know, that's one of the big, that's the very first thing I mentioned to people when they buy lights, right? The China ones almost never have a seal. And if they do, it's only halfway around or, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, the chips that are, they, that are being sold, they say it's a Cree LED. Right. Is it a Cree LED? Right. Uh, what's the light temperature? I mean, blue light versus yellow light makes a huge difference when you're off road. Um, all those things that just, they all come into the consideration when you're discussing the quality of a light and the application of that light. There's a person out there that can greatly benefit from a $50 light. There's a person out there that can't have anything less than, you know, that middle to high tier light because they have actual check boxes they're trying to check off when they put a light on their vehicle that needs to see so far. It needs to see so wide. It needs to be a certain color temperature to not fatigue their eyes during a race, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, all those things come into play when you're talking about a product, uh, specifically lights that we're talking about right now, but just every product has sure. those check boxes that need to be discovered and, and in my opinion, should be searchable and findable and, and comparable. So um, definitely looking to bring that, that level of uh, product review to the industry that hasn't had it so far because it's been mostly, you know, they've come out with this product. It looks great. It's this price. You can get it there, right? Like everybody knows that. You just search yeah, Facebook. Don't, like, don't be surprised if some, with some of these products, some of these companies that want to work with us, we're going to feature it. Then we're going to film us installing it. And then we're going to beat on it for four months. Then we're going to review it. Yeah. And uh, for example, I've had the um, Savage UTV belt case I've talked many times about, and I still haven't got that video done because honestly, it, it went all summer. It got abused in the, in the sunlight. It got abused on purpose by me and my vehicles. Um, and now we have winter here. I want to see how it does with the cold weather. Mm -hmm. I want to see if it, it cracks easily, if it's frozen, things like that. Sure. Um, and so that's where we're like, okay, we where I need to get better, that's maybe a New Year's resolution for me and, and side by side guys is that we get a little bit more um, honest with our timelines and be a little bit more um, uh, forward thinking with how we're going to test it and, and being upfront with that. Uh, and then so that everybody's on the same page and that the community understands what we're doing, that maybe we bring you along for the ride on those long term reviews. And I think that's just going to benefit everybody when you can see a product going from receipt to installation to you know, operating and then being abused and then seeing how it turns out in the long run. Right. Um, there's only so many spots on a vehicle that you can have a light and you can't have 20 different man manufacturers lights on your car all season long, things like that. So there's, there's some give and take on that. Yeah. I went crazy on my YXZ. I was actually just having a conversation, uh, earlier today about really scaling that back and kind of taking a load off the stator and the YXZ, I had so much light that I couldn't run it all at the same time. Right. I had mirror lights, uh, bar, uh, aftermarket headlights, a rear tail light. The, the bar never shut off. It was, uh, it had backlights. So, you know, it was either uh, part, part of the way on or on. Um, and I would say my stator showed a real time, uh, amperage put, uh, it was, a, I think it was a readout at the battery and, with all that stuff on, it was about 11. It's just not doing anything for your battery. It's right. essentially just tickling it. It's not even maintaining it. At that point, you're pulling from your battery. Right. So, yeah, it's interesting. And I think that would be, just to go off topic a little bit, that'd be a great article for us to maybe explore the whole concept of stators and battery power and what you're drawing versus what you're putting back in and all of that stuff. Because 
nobody really has a big idea about that in the industry. Like if you ask somebody, you know, hey, you're getting that thousand dollar light bar. Do you understand what that's doing to right. the rest of your vehicle? Well, it's so critical too. Like one thing that people don't really recognize is, you know, there's certain features about, let's take like the new RZR Pro, for instance, like most of these side-by-sides from the factory push about 50 amps at the stator and the new RZR Pro is about 75. And that just tells me that they know they have a problem. They know, they know that there's just, uh, they're having trouble keeping up with the demand of the aftermarket, the accessories. And so they bumped up their stator to the tune of 25 amps, which is huge, like huge. I mean, like right. m- mine at my max pole was pulling about 25 amps at any given time. And that's what Polaris bumped theirs up to. It's very impressive. Yeah. You know, and I mean, there isn't, I mean, I, I would give, uh, I would pay a lot of money. I would pay a lot of money for my Can-Am to be able to put that kind of power out. Yeah. And that'd be interesting for us to maybe take a comparison. Like what does uh, our old Razor put out? What does your yep. new Can-Am put out? What 50, is the, 53. You know. Roughly. You've already measured your Can-Am? Well, I've, it's just, I'm just going off their information. Oh, when okay. you convert it to amps at 12 volts, you know, watts, amps, all right. that stuff. I figured it was somewhere around 50, uh, 48 to 53. Yeah. That, and, and, even, and, and it's RPM dependent. Oh, true. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, even that that concept of what is amperage and what is wattage and how to interpret that when you're looking at a product is all great information that I think sure. we probably will do a write-up on. Yeah, we can do that. So uh, moving on into uh, this kind of the same topic, it leads it in, it leads into it, um, is the product teardowns and comparisons. When we talked, you know, with the example of lights, right, uh, why not just get a Harbor Freight light and why not just get a, a hundred dollar light and a, see if somebody will sponsor a higher end light that we can then open them up, compare them to each other. And, and you know, if it's a reputable, reputable brand, they're going to back up what they're saying with what they have. Right. right so, right. um, I think the quality of components, how they're put together, um, in everything, not just light bars, but everything is, is something that everybody wants to see, wants to hear, wants to know for a fact that the marketing message behind that product is valid. Um, and that's something that we want to jump into and, and actually show it. Uh, I, as a you know, electrical engineering nerd, like to see that kind of stuff. As a mechanical engineering nerd, I like to see that kind of stuff tore down. Uh, why did they make the choice of that design? Are those heat sinks actually working? Is um, you know, did they put the high quality wire in there, or is it the cheap wire? Like all that kind of stuff just intrigues me and makes me more validated in my decision to purchase something. And then product premieres and installations like. There's new products coming out on a fairly regular basis. Um, this year alone, there's been um, a couple new products. And to work with those companies, develop a relationship where we can pull those new products uh, before launch and validate them, install them, have content around those products, I think will benefit not only their product and their push for marketing that new product, but also the community that has the interest of that product and has all the questions. I mean, when you put a product out, you have your intentions. You have things in your head as a marketer saying, this is who I'm marketing it towards. And this is the message I want to put out with it. And as soon as you put it out, all that goes away because now everybody has a thousand questions about it. Um, And so we want to be in a position where we can bring that product and those answers to the market and be the voice to the community that the marketers can't do. Yeah, that is a, that's such an interesting, almost like an open-ended topic unto itself. Like when you bring out a product and you're set to market it in a particular fashion, the end users are going to be the ones that are going to tell you how that product's being used. Right. And we're in a unique position where we can hear directly from them. That put that, that ability to validate a uh, brand's purpose of making a product or validate a community's demand for a product or all that, like there's a gap there and you either have to trust the brands to understand what you're saying and what you're doing, or you have to trust the community that they're not just full of a bunch of hot air. Right. Right. And so that's kind of where we want to fill the gap. And, if, and again, a, a, a request for the community's input to send us questions, send us your experience. If you, if you put new tires on and you went and ran them, uh, for a weekend ride and you slashed two of the four tires you put on your car because they have crappy sidewalls, like that's knowledge that the community doesn't have until someone puts it out there. Right. And so uh, when you're in a Facebook group of a small number of people, a lot of times you miss out on that information. And when you're in Facebook groups of thousands of people, um, you can get diluted down and never get a response that's quality outside of those suck or these are best, or you should buy that should have bought those instead. Or right. that question gets asked every day on the UTV threads. It's uh, what is the best insert product request here? Right. And basically you get nowhere. 
when you put when you post something like that because essentially what you're going to get is you're going to get 60 to about 200 people commenting about what they bought right it has nothing to do with it being the best right you know if if you want to know what the best is you probably need to do a little bit more digging or you need to talk to people that are ta- taking this stuff and and just pushing it to the max like some of the race teams right. desert racers I mean, you think those guys are going to put garbage on their car no right there's always going to be a gap between a community of people running their mouths at like light speed versus somebody that actually takes the data, organizes it, puts it into a comparable data set that you can then justify right. your action on. And we're going to try and filter through all that stuff and just put it through our own rigors and yep. provide feedback. Yep. And hopefully if we can get if we can get our ducks in a row for everything, we'll have a system, a way of doing that that everybody can contribute to without us having to put in our hours after hours after hours um, and let the community actually drive it versus us trying to push it. Right. Yeah. Right. Because we have, we have more conversation topics that you can shake a stick at and any question could derail us off on an entire (laughs) show. And and that's a good thing, you know? Yeah. So, so going into additional things that we want to run this year, um, you know, we want to develop more of our actual video production stuff. And uh, the next half of this list is all around that, right? So we have the idea of creating uh, riding destination features, like where we go to a place that you would want to go ride to and, and feature uh, the entire experience of loadout, uh, traveling, hitting the the points of interest and things that maybe you um, may have missed if you didn't know the area, things like that, teaming up with people of the area to find the best spots for, you know, the scenic lookouts and the photo uh, opportunities and maybe the best camping sites, things like that, where you can um, uh, I know a lot of uh, Idahoans would tell me, that, you know, stay out, don't tell anybody about our place. Uh, but there's places in Idaho that I think everybody should take the opportunity to visit. I, I, think did, <clears throat> I completely disagree. Stay, <laughs> stay out of Idaho, 100%. <laughs> um, and there's places in Washington and Oregon and all, all around the country. There's places that people uh, of the off-road nature uh, should have the opportunity to experience and they just don't know about them. Um, and I think that for smaller communities, especially the ones that are opening up the the, the roads to the UTVs and things like that, uh, passing a uh, legal uh, opportunity for you to drive down the street, uh, it's a big economic thing for them, Yeah, prom- promoting the tourist industry. Yeah, you start thinking about what kind of riding is available to you. And uh, I had a kind of a weird thought process while going down the freeway earlier today. <clears throat> I mean, there's certain people that would probably rather spend time on a trail system that's about two to 300 acres that provides some pretty technical stuff, mud, rutted out, rocks. So the question is, if you had access to a park like that, let's say not seven mile um, in our backyard, so seven miles, this little park that's, uh, I don't know how many acres it is. I want to say it's, I like want to say it's around 500, 500 yeah. acres, give or take. It's just a little play area. It's got a little bit of everything. I don't think there's much rock crawling, a lot of rutted out tree stuff. You're going to be competing against a bunch of dirt bikes. So what would you rather do? Would you rather go to that and go riding for the day? Or would you rather go to Priest Lake where you have 400,000 acres right. to just go rip? I mean, essentially you could leave Priest Lake and drive to Coeur d'Alene, which, you know, for people who don't know that, it's a long way. So you can do all that on the ladder. Like I prefer to go out and get get to places where I'm not going to I'm going to see stuff I've never seen, and I'm going to not run into anybody. Right, that's the type of riding I like to do. And speaking back to that, everybody has their own method of yeah. creating their their persona in the off road industry. Um, a lot of it actually has to do with uh, what's around you and who's around you. Yeah. Um, so if you if you're talking about up here in the Pacific Northwest, right, you're going to have two riders. You're going to have or three three riders. You're going to have the guys that are. Um, always looking for a challenge. And so the off-road parks are going to be something they're looking for or racetracks or, you know, things that have new things for them to try to conquer. Um, and then you're going to have the guys that are like, well, I just want to take it easy and, and cruise and do the sand dunes and do the trails and do the whatevers. But if you go out east, you're going to have the guys that are like, I'm going to go do trails, but trails to them versus trails to us is completely different. It is. Like up here in the Northwest, we're doing trails. Where, that means we're putting a hundred plus miles on, on, on uh, fire roads and logging roads and things like that. My car could be 80 inches wide. It's not going to shut me down out of anywhere. Mostly it's nowhere. Not how it is yeah. out back east. And then back east, you're talking you're talking trail riding is 60 squeezing, inches. <laughs> squeezing through trees, going right. up steep inclined banks, going down through creeks, going you know through obstacles, around obstacles, all that kind of stuff, um, and finding a lot more geographical obstacles and, and formations to conquer versus here where it's more like, there's an industry that you're benefiting from because they've made roads for you. 
um, and especially during fire season, which is the predominantly most of the summer season, um, you're not going to have the opportunity when they when they lock you onto the trails and you can't go off a trail uh, anyway. It's because you might set a forest fire. So, right. um, you know, every market, every geographical location of the country um, is going to have different riding styles, different opportunities. Um, and then, you know, just who's around it, who's going to push you further, who's going to say, no, let's take it chill. Um, if you're traveling with a family or not family, all those things come into variables. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's one of the unique sports where that all comes into play. Like if you're talking about, um, you know, actual sports like baseball or whatever, you're, you're relegated by the rules, the teams, the structures, locations you talk about fishing you're going to be very isolated you're going to be very up to whatever you're feeling like um and whatever's around you within a short travel distance uh off-road is very well you make it what you wanted to make it right make it up as you go along yeah and so your experience with that uh off-road experience is going to be completely dependent on how much experience you have what you've taken with you who you've taken with you where you're going all of it every single time i've gone off-roading there's always a story with it there's always a memory with it. There's always people that share those memories in a different way. Um, so I think it's very unique and, and why we love this uh, sport so much. So riding destinations, that's, we want to, we want to get out there. We want to do it. We want to do it with people. We want to do it with people that know the areas, you know, things like that. And that includes trails that includes off-road parks that includes sand dunes that includes private properties. Right. If it's like something that people want to know about. Uh, and so we're looking for those partners as well. Yeah, in terms of destination features in 2020, I mean, we could probably touch on that a little. Did you want to touch on it right now? Like well, we, we can. Yeah, I mean, we, it's we, not, uh, not a huge off track. So. Yeah, we've got we've got some great stuff planned. I mean, we're going to be on sand dunes. We'll be in central Washington, so that's going to see us in the desert, in the forest, uh, northern Idaho. It's going to be predominantly forest, a lot of, a lot of fire road type stuff. Uh, we've got an opportunity to go down to uh, Utah. So and that'll be my first trip down there. It'll be the first time I've actually ridden down there. Looking forward to that. Possibly Arizona. Um in terms of what you and I are doing, uh, with the exception of Arizona, it's just, you know, it's all on the calendar as it sits right now. It looks like we might be going to the Oregon coast two or three times over the next 10 months. It looks like, uh, we've got a couple, couple things planned. We'll, we can go into that a and little the, bit more. And that'll there. be all completely different content too. For sure. So like when we say we're going to be there three times. Yeah. We're not going to miss the opportunity to film. Yeah. There's going to be three different experiences and three different focuses and, and whatever else comes along with it. So, right. um, we, we really want everybody to come with us for that ride and meet us there and uh, be a part of it as well. So, um, And then event coverage, which that speaks right into, right? We're going to be going to some of these events and covering what they are and, and the community around it and what to see. Yep. And, and Get a two for one, destination coverage, event yep. coverage, all, all in one basket. Yeah. So if you do see us there and we have cameras in our hands, like, don't be surprised. <laughs> We're going to be filming everything. So, um, and, uh, feel free to come say hi and, and all that. And we, we definitely want to get to know people and to get to know new partners and, and what and, type of rider you are, where you like to go, maybe some yeah. places we haven't touched on that we want to check out. I mean, I'm honestly, if I were to, uh, if I was to put out the place that I want to ride most right now at central Oregon, outside of Bend, Oregon, um, I would like for us to go hit that within the next 12 yeah. months. And that's totally doable. It's about five hours from us. So. Yeah. And, and I've only ever ridden the Oregon sand dune. So getting onto the Oregon trails I've heard is a, is a riot and there's a lot of great uh, stuff to do out there. So volcanic lava rock, we get to drive on it. Just, yeah, it's um, unbelievable. Yeah. And, and Oregon's beautiful as it is. So yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, so event coverage is going to be a big thing for us this year. Hopefully we'll get out as much as possible. Um, and if anyone has an event that they want to maybe have us out to let us know, uh, info at side by side guys.com or visit the contact us page on the website. Um, and, uh, moving off of events into projects, uh, you know, there's a lot of times where we as UTV enthusiasts have projects in the back of our heads that never get done. Um, and so, uh, we want to get out of that bad habit and make some things happen and document them and bring you along for the ride and maybe be educational in the process yeah. or, or whatever else. And then getting into Ian's wheelhouse, um, talking about overlanding and maybe some, uh, other types of videography that we might be getting into. Um, kind of what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, you and I were talking about doing a specific video for, uh, Overland, Overland setup, um, some of the things that worked, worked for us, worked for me. Um, it could even be rig specific. I mean, mm -hmm. there could be some stuff that we do on my uh, Can-Am that's different 
from what we were doing on the YXE just based on how it's working with that platform. So I'm really interested in to see how that how that develops. Well, we do have uh, we do have a couple of scheduled rides. I don't uh, <clears throat> I don't know that we need to like let the cat out of the bag, but we no. are you know it's no secret the Washington BDR has been knocked off the list, and in 2020 <laughs> we're going to go do it again. Right. Possibly even a couple of times. Um, the Idaho BDR is on the list right now. I think we've got ourselves a pretty good plan on how to attack that. That's so far, that will be far and away the most ambitious ride just based on uh, logistics, length. I think that sucker is about 1,200 to 1,400 miles long. So you have to do it in right. legs because obviously you can't drive a side by side on the freeway. Um, and then, uh, you know, just kind of overlanding overlanding really just kind of scratches the itch for me it's it's essentially riding <laughs> i mean at, at the core it's just out there going to go see a bunch of stuff that you've never seen before it's uh partially uh tackling terrain um there's just so much gratification in putting your your vehicle to use for a specific purpose and just being completely reliant on it for the better part of two to three days and having your gear work for you, having your machine work for you, as well as going to see some stuff that you would never in a million years get out to go see. So, I mean, overlanding is really, really fun. And it's the more I, more I talk about it, the more people have been coming up to me and hitting me up wanting, wanting to take part in it. Right. And so, I think it's a huge opportunity also for tourism and industry. It's, to, a, it's an emerging market. Yeah. If you don't believe me, ask Polaris. Yeah. Well, I mean, even Polaris hinted at the idea, well, technically they've already started doing uh, adventure rides and rentals yep. and guides yep. um, you know, through Polaris Adventures, I think it's yep. called. And so that's kind of like the corporate uh, uh, insurance constrained version of it. Um, and so, uh, when you start seeing the market grow into, uh, supporting the rental industry and the, and, and the experience industry that goes around it, um, it's only going to grow faster and stronger in, in the States that are willing to adopt it. I mean, there's some States that there's only so much you can do. You can't really go do a whole lot of Louisiana <laughs> cross tracking. Uh, but, uh, in the States like Nevada, California, Utah, Washington, uh, some, some of Oregon, uh, Idaho, Montana, all those states have a lot of overland opportunity. Sure. And so um, we definitely want to be a part of that growing trend and uh, experience all that that has to give. So Not even be a part of it. Just drive it. Drive it. Sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've, uh, we've done a couple of things on UTVs that have never been done before, you know, and as I, I think at one point I said that that's not a motivator. I mean, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, you know. You're wavering on this a little uh, well, bit. I think it's my coming back. <laughs> so my we take might have to put a disclaimer on is, last episode. Is there gratification in being the first person to ever accomplish something? I don't know. Try it. Try being the first person <laughs> to ever accomplish something and let me know how it feels. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's definitely a feather in the cap. And um, I think that we all uh, are capable of our own yeah. accomplishments. And I think there's nothing... Uh, less motivating than being able to just simply show that it's possible. Right. And, you know, and when you start to report back on what it is that you did and how it went for you, you put that into a forum on Facebook. It just brings in so much, com so much uh, traffic, so many comments. You get to see people tagging each other. So, you know, you're inspiring people, you know, mm -hmm. you're inspiring them to go out and challenge, maybe not necessarily challenge themselves, but they see something epic and they want to try it. They want to be a part of it. And yeah. uh, that's honestly the primary reason why I do it is just to, it's a conversation topic. I mean, obviously there's self-serving interests. I get to go out there and just do something that's incredible, right. but it's also epic. 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 Yeah, I, I, I'm not a big like New Year's resolution guy, but going into the new year, I always have like a focus of like a topic, like I'm going to, this is going to happen or, or this is going to be my focus or whatever. And, uh, definitely this year has been, you know, the mantra do more. Yeah. And, uh, and I, hopefully that's portrayed in what we put out there for everybody else is that we want to do more. We want you to do more because everyone's sitting at home wanting to do more, but they just never do it. So if we can provide ways and avenues for that to happen, then we all benefit. Um, and so film projects, are, are, do you have anything you want to speak to that? But I mean, I, the more content and the more ideas we put out there, it's like less time we have for these big ideas. My, my take is on that is with the resources that we have, uh, both from a production standpoint and the places that we're going, it would be so cool for us to put together. I'm not saying it'd be like a year in the life of 
type thing. I would think it would probably be very, very ride specific. We have some things that we're going to do on these BDR trips, uh, not to let the cat out of the bag, but uh, a certain off-road celebrity is trying to go with us on the w, uh, on the Washington BDR and film the whole thing for a show, uh, for a basically a syndicated television show. Right. And uh, so that's kind of exciting. You know, we'll see how that develops. I mean, until you're on trail. I'm operating under the assumption that it's not going to happen because it is a massive, massive undertaking. But from a talent standpoint, between uh, what you bring to the table, what I bring to the table, and some of our uh, some of our buddies bring to the table uh, on the Idaho one, and especially we want to bring our buddy Cam on, and uh, he'll be riding with me. Cam's a uh, he's a documentary filmmaker, you know, and it's just one of those things where you get three creatives together and you just start filming and you just see what develops. And I mean, ideally, would it be would it would it be kind of cool to see something that we developed on Amazon Prime? Absolutely. On Netflix? Absolutely. You know, no, it's just, you and I are, you and I are pretty fortunate. You know, we don't have to do a lot of gearing up to develop something like that. And we also know people who uh, not only want to be a part of it, but are also f- set up to be able to do this stuff. So, yeah. I mean, if we're going to go out there and do some really epic stuff, let's capture it. Yep. So uh, hopefully by the, en- the year's end, we'll have some epic stuff to talk about. That's right. So, um, actually, we did pretty good for time today, Ian. Uh, what, what are you at? What are you seeing? Um, I'm at 15 minutes, so we did two takes. That was about an hour. So we're about an hour and a quarter, hour and a half. Well, let's just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just to kind of wrap up the episode, uh, there wasn't really a whole lot of events going on uh, this month outside of racing. Uh, a lot of desert racing was taking off um, this this month. Uh, so, uh, But there was a little bit of product news. Um, Pro Armor announced that they're going to put out the 33-inch version of their XR tire, which has uh, previously only been in, I think, 27-inch and 32-inch. Um, so the fact that they're out with a 33-inch, um, I'm not sure if they're going to continue to discontinue the 32-inch or not, but the fact that they put out a 33 by 10, uh, 15 tire on a race tire tells me that they're getting a little bit more serious about being in the racing market. Um, I know that there's some race series that uh, put you at 32 inches uh, or less, but as we all know, tire manufacturers have a really uh, bad habit of saying that their tire is bigger than it is. So I'm wondering if that XR tire is going to measure at 32 or within the the margin buffer on the tire measurements uh, for the off road desert racing scene. Um, Pro Armor is owned. So so first I'll say the Pro Armor tires are made by MRT, who make a huge selection of race tires as it is, and and great tires as it is they have a lot of kevlar reinforced tires things like that um they have a, a number of dual uh durometer type tires that are also very popular um so they make the tires for pro armor and uh they already have a 33 inch uh, uh tire on the xr series that is a kevlar reinforced where the pro armor is a nylon reinforced i believe um but being so raced focused i'm wondering if they actually measure out to 32 or within that buffer because Pol- polaris owns pro armor and Polaris is really investing a ton of money into racing. Like they were popular in the racing and they, they made the Mint 400 for the UTVs and they made, they didn't make the Mint 400. The Mint 400 was already there, but they, they're the ones that influenced the Mint 400 to include UTVs. They're the ones that pushed Camp Razor and all these other things that really pushed the Razors into the explosive market that it has become. And I'd be willing to bet that this tire measures within the race specs for all the Desert Series and is the tire that they're going to push on all their sponsored athletes unless they're already signed with someone like tensor or bfg or one of those tire uh, race tire manufacturers um so every single person that i've ever talked to about a pro armor tire um has had nothing but good things to say about their xgs which is their softer dual compound uh so they have the xr's like harder dur- durometer in the middle and then as you work your way out uh it has the softer uh, durometer so it, it gives you the stiffness but also the grippiness that you need for all different terrains and they have a nice deep lug on them and everyone has just fantastic things that they say about those tires uh the interesting thing is that they came out with the xr in 33 not the xg in 33 and everybody's saying i want the xg in 33 not the xr so i'd be willing to bet that that's uh, polaris's new push for a uh, race tire in 2020 going into 21 as well and then our friends over at SSV Works uh, announced a new product, uh, their Switchworks uh, SWE12 power and control system, which we were talking earlier about amperage draws. Uh, so I'm interested to know how this works with that, but it's a 200 amp 
uh, switchable, uh, solid state switchable power system, much like Switch Pros or something like that. Sure. And it, the ben, the neat thing about this is it's all uh, LCD buttons, so it's they're all clear buttons, but behind them is an LCD screen that you can then program with a customizable icon or picture or whatever. So you can have a picture of a horn, and when you push it, it turns red. Or you can have a green uh, rock light that glows green when you push it, um, or whatever the case may be. And you can also macro those together. So if you have light cubes, light bars, rock lights, whatever, blinkers, um, you can actually trigger them in a sequence together or turn them on all together. Like you could have an individually on off button and then an, an all on button, things like that. Um, so I really can't wait to get my hands on one of those. It seems really cool and something that I've always wanted, uh, but never knew, uh, didn't ever think that a manufacturer would put it out for the UTV industry. I think it's going to displace, uh, or this style of switch is going to displace, uh, rocker switches anytime soon. I don't think it'll be displace them per se, because... We've seen uh, companies like Polaris put out the Pro XP with, I think, 14 switch positions or something like that, uh, which is insane. And so, it's like James Bond right there. Yeah. And if you're putting that many switches on your vehicle, again, going back to that stator discussion, like how much can you run at once yeah. and how many things can you put on your vehicle before it becomes just useless accessories? Um, you know, you. you I've been in vehicles that I've built that I've that have needed up to six, seven switches or whatever the case was, but going beyond twelve yeah. is is pretty crazy. Yeah, I think this is more for the guy that just doesn't want to litter his dash with buttons or has a custom dash like a carbon uh, uh, a fiberworks dash or like a race dash and doesn't want to have a thousand buttons laid across. Um, or the guys that just have maybe machines that don't have all the switch options uh, and want something all in one location that's easy to because of the customizable buttons you can easily identify where you need to push and and what's active and what's not active right right I, i've got something go ahead in terms of a uh, product launch yeah. um i wouldn't say it's launched something we're in the process of developing right now um kind of hope you know we you and i had that conversation in a little while ago about quote unquote game changers mm -hmm. um and we don't like that term um we do have a product that we're in the process of uh doing some r&d on and i'll probably be the guy that does the majority of the r&d on currently as it says nobody's built a true dual purpose lithium battery for utv and the reason that they haven't done that it's because you get one of two functions with lithium. You either get uh, deep cycle capacity or you get starting. And it's regulated by an internal computer. Nobody really has figured out a, a solid way. Let's take a U1, for instance. A U1 is a factory on anything Yamaha, anything Kawasaki. It's what I pre predominantly recommend people upgrade to in a Can MX3. You switch to the U1 footprint, and it's basically the size of a garden tractor battery. And you know, it ranges between somewhere around 165 cold cranking amps to about 500 cold cranking amps in that footprint that you can get with conventional chemistries like AGM or like flooded. So we have a U1 lithium battery that is going to be used specifically as a cycler on a UTV. And when we go out and do these, uh, these backcountry discovery routes when we go out and doing this this overland we're going to put this thing to the test and what it is it's the same size as the u it's a u1 footprint but it is 53 amp hour which is almost you know conventionally u1 is roughly about 35 anywhere from 30 to 35 so we're going to get about 53 amp hour out of the same footprint and it's going to weigh 11 pounds somewhere in that ballpark so i'm really interested to see i would love for this be to for this to be a standard product that we offer Roughly about the beginning of 2021, I think it could be. Uh, I think it could be a great tool for people that are going out doing any sort of camping off these things. You know, a lot of guys will run an inverter on their car, um, dual battery kit. You'll have to do some isolation type stuff with a lithium battery being in conjunction with a flooded chemistry or with uh, your OE battery or anything. Um, but I am really interested to see where this thing takes off because I, I think as we try to develop a lithium battery that'll serve both functions, you know, cause you want to satisfy what the car requires to turn over and then you want to satisfy what it'll, what it'll require from an amp hour capacity standpoint. So we don't want to go backwards. We don't want something that'll crank 1100 cold cranking amps, but only have about 20 amp hour. That's useless. You know, we want something that's probably going to crank somewhere around 300 to 350. And in real, in reality for the first five seconds, going to crank somewhere around 500. That'll start a Cummins diesel much less my can amp, but also have somewhere between 45 to 55 amp hours of reserve capacity. That's huge. Just absolutely huge. It's a, it's a battery that you can camp off of, uh, 
you could probably power it because I want to say it's something uh, like 50, uh, 15 to 25 amps continuous. Well, uh, uh, well, ARB, an ARB fridge pulls down roughly about eight. So you could power that all night with a battery the size of a, a garden tractor battery. Hmm. So it's, it's going to be interesting. You know, it's going to take a lot of tinkering. The big thing about lithium is, 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 is it going to be a resilient to abuse, right? Because if it's not, it's useless. It's right. essentially a paperweight. Well, and the so, big thing about lithium, right? I mean, talk about all the cell phones and tablets that use lithium right now uh, is puncture resistance, right? So if you're going to be thinking about lithium, you'd be looking at uh, making sure it's puncture resistant. I mean, all batteries are puncture resistant, but... If you can't keep a lithium battery safe you run the risk of burning up your machine. Because right. when lithium catches fire, it's not going out. Yeah, once once you get the reaction started yep. on a puncture, it's you're it's not going to stop it. Yep. yep, it's done. So you have to think about how it's being charged, how it's being stored, and uh, you want to put it into a position where it has the least amount of susceptibility to damage. And I would say maybe even airflow, depending on your draw and how much it's heating up. Uh, those things are, as re- they're very resilient yep. from, a, a, you know, too hot, too cold, and and they're pretty resilient in terms of how you can charge them as well. So we we've got a lot of that stuff figured out. It's just going to be de- it, what we're going to determine whether or not it's going to survive. And are you saying this is in conjunction with a secondary battery, yeah, or that it would replace? You don't want to, fir- yeah, primary. you don't want to replace your starter, right? You know, one thing you could do though is you could uh, you could dump your starting battery and move to another lithium battery, a much much smaller footprint. Like you could take a, a nine amp hour lithium battery, and that thing will start your car. You know, yeah. it has no amp hour capacity whatsoever, but it will generate enough current to turn your car over. So you would want to use that in conjunction with um, with a deep cycle. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. And they will not be cheap. You can't. <laughs> I mean, lith- lithium is not cheap. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's not cheap to acquire. It's not cheap to build. It's not cheap to develop. As soon as we, you know, I can see it already. As soon as we release it to the public. As soon as. Uh, you know, if we put this thing through the trials and errors there and, uh, and it's functioning the way we expect it to, we're going to put it out there on the market and people are going to laugh at it. Right. right. Laugh at it all you want. You're just not the type of rider that needs something like this. Right. You know, for the guys that are going out for three, four nights, this is right up your alley. Yeah. So also to uh, follow up those product launches, we also have the Dakar race happening over in Saudi Arabia. They moved it uh, to Saudi Arabia this year. Um, and there's a number of big UTV athletes re- racing the SSB class. Um, and there's also the, uh, the like the Red Bull uh, uh, prototype, prototype yeah. that's running that we've covered. Um, and so they're finishing stage nine. They finished stage eight this morning. Uh, we're recording on uh, January 13th today. Um, so they're going to be finishing stage nine our tomorrow, but they're there tonight or this morning. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how that stacks up. And I had posted a, a, a thing on the, I think it was Facebook. Uh, I think 99% of all the vehicles racing the SSB class are all you know, uh, Can-Am based, X, X3 based. I thought that was really interesting. There's a handful of, of Polaris out there, but there's no, I think I, I think I even saw like one YXZ out there. Uh, but there is such a dominance in the uh, in the overseas market of Can Am racing. Um, we've talked a little bit about what to expect and um, like future development of off road and UTV, and we talked about maybe that that uh, non North America market growing for these OEs. Um, it seems like Can Am owns the racing scene outside of the U.S. Uh, and I, I'm I'm really interested to see how that grows from an OE stance on. We're talking about uh, Yamaha, Polaris, possibly Kawasaki if they want to improve their their Terex platform. Um, but uh, so that'll be right. That'll be finishing up. And then we have the best in the desert Parker 250 that just wrapped up last week uh, with a number of uh, interesting athletes topping the podiums there. Uh, and speaking to what I just said about Can-Am owning the overseas market, Polaris kind of own, owns the United States market as far as racing goes. Um Top of the two, the, the two of the top three in both the 1000 and turbo classes were Polaris's and the other ones were Can-Am's. So uh, really interesting to see the, the difference between interstate and then out, you yeah. know, overseas. I didn't dive too much into the results of the Parker, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think Robbie, didn't he hit the podium on that Rob, uh, speed uh, machine? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Gordon raced, third or um, something. I, I don't remember exactly which class it was, uh, but he raced with uh, his son. Uh, yeah. I think it's 13 or yeah. something like that. And I'm just saying that just because it's interesting. You know, we're, we, we've talked about it on a prior episode where we were a little bit, we were intrigued as to what's coming, as to what he's in the process of developing. And I did notice uh, just briefly when I looked at the results that uh, if I remember right, he was in the top five. He might have even been in the top three. 
So, uh, not a whole lot going on in January, but if you're interested in racing or the King of Hammers in general, that starts January 31st. Uh, that is a um, Friday through Sunday, February 9th. Uh, all the different race classes going through that obstacle course, which is just mind blowing. I would love to go down and experience it at least once. Um, but the the King of the Hammers is always the one that people talk about as the ultimate. Who you uh, got? What's that? Who you got? Who do I got? Yeah, I haven't been following it close enough to know all the all the contenders, but yeah, my my get you know the Guthries have owned that event the last couple of years. They have, so, yeah. You know, I'm I'm going to be rooting for uh, Jason Weller and uh, Kyle Osborne. Kyle Osborne's from uh, I think he's from Yakima, but he's uh, we've got some local we got a local team heading down there, the Hellbent Boys. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully they have a great race. That'd be great. Yeah, good luck to those yeah, guys. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And same with Jason Weller. You know, we've been with uh, Weller Racing since day one at Full Throttle and. And Jason is uh, this first year. He's doing the mach- doing the run, doing the race on a uh, Can Am. He's been doing the last couple of years on a YXZ, and uh, at, at King and Hammers. At King and Hammers. Oh. so and Can Am, man, I gotta. I think Can Am is just all in on that race. They want to displace Polaris. Oh, for fierce, sure. So it uh, it's interesting. What's interesting is I also read a, an article on one of the UTV news sites um, about Yamaha's uh, hundred thousand dollar purse. Uh, to distribute across uh, Yamaha winnings if they podium and, and stuff like that. So there's a big incentive for the Yamaha guys to win uh, some nice some nice dollars there. And if you look at over the last couple of years, the way that the Greaves, um, CJ and uh, Jason Weller performed with that YXZ, Kyle Os- uh, I'm sorry, Kyle, uh, uh, Kyle Anderson from Weller Racing ran it a couple of years ago too, and I think he was in top 10. And he was commenting about that car being – improperly labeled essentially saying that the the yxe is a, a desert car a dune car well kyle was saying that the majority of the people he passed was in the rocks yeah. it was basically because you could just throw a yxe into the rocks and it has the their ability to put up with it just keep getting beaten on let's call it what it is though man i mean you know you don't win back to back king of hammers without having a formula down pretty pat but yeah. there's a component of luck to an there, event there's like that, a just component of so luck, and there's a component of how much you can invest in your suspension. Yeah. So um, there's a lot. There's a lot that has to do with how hard you can run into things. Yeah. And there's a, a lot to do with um, how much articulation you have. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to do, uh, discount anything. It, it comes down to the driver. It comes down to the For driver. Sure. It comes down to the team. It comes down to the strategy. But let me, especially strategy is huge at King Hammers. Yep. But uh, you know, luck is a huge i mean how i couldn't even begin to tell you how many people i've seen running in the top five and then they dnf yep you know just yep. a mechanical failure and it just took them out and yep. you know hopefully hopefully everybody has a great race and has a lot of good luck because we, we want to we want to see who, who claims it oh not, yeah not, sure. not who winds up with it who claims it you know so <laughs> yeah that that's that's the race that yeah. that separates the uh the newbies from the the experienced guys oh, for yeah. sure yeah and no, it was a great time of year for racing and you know supercross just fired up too and uh, uh since we recorded our last show we had anaheim one and uh, st louis and if if supercross keeps trending the way that the, the results were in the first two races of the year it's going to be a really interesting series right yeah so just wanted to wrap up the episode with a couple things uh last uh episode was our holiday episodes and and our looking forward episodes or looking back episodes so they really didn't have any room for this but uh, my pick of the week um is actually out of left field armor all tire shine uh tire foam tire shine uh this is just the basic generic walmart two dollar can of tire foam but this stuff uh is uh like a lot of other uh protectants um has the um silicons there you go it has the silicons in it that create um what we all know as the greasy effect yeah when you go to clean something but um it doesn't have so much that it's off-putting and so much that it's dust attracting but the reason i bring it up the reason i actually have it is to restore the black on the roll cage. So when you get a when you get a power coated roll cage like OE roll cage, um, or the frame or any of those pieces that are black uh, powder coated, you never get that black shine, that black that deep black that you get when you first buy it. Right, first time out, it starts to gray out a little bit, um, and every time you wash it, it gets a little bit more hazy. Every time you use it and run into something, um, it's not going to take out uh, scratches or or damage to the coat. But if you have an actual uh, black that's starting to gray or starting to, to haze up a little bit that stuff you spray it on there let it sit for a few minutes wipe it down 
um, will definitely bring back the black luster that was in your roll cage when you bought it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, before a major event, I have my UTV detailed Mm -hmm. and I have it detailed in Spokane, a place called Spokane Auto Detail. Mm -hmm. And they do such a good job of it that I start to question whether or not my machine's ever seen a trail before. It literally <laughs> looks like showroom condition. That's yeah. that's kind of cool. I'm interested to see how that product works. Yeah. So. so I'm not saying it's not greasy feeling. Like if you put it on, wipe it off and feel it, it's enough feel greasy because of the silicon. Uh, but the silicon and the the petrol items that are in the comp- the comp- composition of the product are what actually give that luster back to yeah. the to the coating. Like you can't get away from that. That's actually what solves the problem is the petrol and the silicon in the spray. Um, and so uh, I sprayed down Uncle Bren's uh, razor uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, and it hasn't hazed up after applying it at all. And and even he commented when he took it out for a ride. Um, he could, he noticed where I had missed <laughs> yeah. and where, where I had done it. So, um, it makes a big difference if you're looking for a really cheap, really easy way to get that black back on your cage. Uh, that stuff is super cheap. It's available everywhere yeah, and I'm easy to do. I'm interested to see what kind of residue it leaves too. Cause like one thing that used to just crack me up, like at SEMA or any one of these shows, uh, you would have trophy girls that would go stand next to my car <laughs> and then they'd take pictures and then they'd sit on my tires Yeah, and I'd be just like, Oh, that's not going to yeah, it's not gonna look good. Yeah, your butt looks like I just ran you over. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, I'm not saying it's for plastics, and I'm not saying it's for any of that stuff, um, painted or anything, because uh, that's where it will leave like a residue yeah. that's visible. Um, it's I'm I'm really only recommending it for the powder coated parts, um, and then you know you could shine your tires too. Oh while heck you're at yeah. It. Um, and then also I wanted to kind of bring this up as a thought. Um, I've had a number of episodes here where I have thoughts after the uh, episodes wrapped up. Um, but I was walking through Walmart buying that product. Um, and I noticed that there was a UTV action mag, um, on the magazine rack. And I was actually looking for a dirt bike mag for my son, but I ran across this and it just kind of reiterated, uh, the importance for us to support our industry. Uh, what people don't realize is that these magazines are super expensive to produce, um, to get out there, especially when you have low quantities, uh, getting into a Walmart is obviously a great opportunity for a magazine publisher like them. Um, but as an industry, um, magazines are dying off and they're going more online, things like that. And people think that if they just go to the website, they're going to get everything that's in this magazine no, minus the ads. Not at all. And that's just simply not true. Right. Um, and so uh, just reaching out to everybody saying, hey, if you have the opportunity, if you have the, the means to do so, please subscribe to the different vendors that put out content, the magazines, uh, the video content creators, all those guys all could use your support because every time we support them, they support us through the industry and our industry grows and we get more exposure and we get more cool products and we get more cool media. So every time we support them with our dollars or our actions, um, you know, that's something that we should do. Sure. Yeah. You've got uh, UTV action, you've got uh, UTV magazine, you've got dirt wheels and uh, online you have uh, UTV sports mag. Yeah. yeah. There's four fantastic publications right there. Yep. And a lot of the brands that we work with or want to work with all, you know, support those uh, magazines by advertising in them and things like that. So um, if you happen to run across a product or a brand that you're going to purchase from, just say, hey, you know, this is where we saw you. This is where we right. uh, where we got a hold of your information. So anyways, um, you know, not, not a whole lot going on the rest of the month. Um, and uh, looking forward to February. That's when a lot of things start rolling. Uh, there's going to be a lot of interest in the, in the racing scene. Um, I'm curious to our audience, uh, how much you like the racing information. Um, I'm not a big racer at heart. Like it's not something that I've always like followed. So I don't know all the top athletes. I don't know all the top teams and all that stuff, but is that content that you guys want? Is that something you want us to cover? Cause if it is, then we'll start covering it more. We'll start paying more attention to it and following it more to bring it to the podcast and to the website and to the Facebook and all that stuff. Yeah. And there's some competing, you know, I'm not going to say competing. Every, every podcast kind of has its niche, kind of has certain Right. things that focus on but uh, there's some podcasts that kind of are centric towards and, and they do uh, do some coverage of UTV and they do a pretty good job of covering the race thing so I mean yeah yeah I mean I wouldn't be surprised to get some feedback kind of both ways yeah know. we're not looking to compete necessarily sure. in that niche but we're just curious and, and wondering if the if the community is interested yeah. in that information or not I'll make my lemonade analogy again so. <laughs> 
So anyways, uh, hopefully you are subscribed to our podcast. We're putting a lot of effort into making this a great thing. Um, you can find us on Spotify. Uh, you can find us on Apple and Google uh, podcasts as well as Stitcher, things like that. Uh, we're also uploading to SoundCloud. So if you're on SoundCloud and listening to all the independent artists there, you can find us there. Um, and we're available on YouTube and, and uh, Facebook, Instagram. Follow us, like us, share us, and let's see you know how well we can grow this community. I've kind of put... Um, an unofficial target uh, on on us to be over 10,000 followers on our platforms. So uh, we're about halfway there. We're around that 4,000, 5,000 mark on all of them. And, uh, you know, don't be surprised if you hear from me to prompt you to subscribe and share for something, maybe some giveaways that are incentivized by uh, sharing. Uh, But um, yeah, that's kind of my unofficial goal is to be over 10,000 by the end of the year. I think we have reasonable expectations to be able to do that. Um, and hopefully more for sure. So anyways, great episode again. Thanks for coming by. My pleasure till the next one. Peace. Peace.